imagine that people come to your event and they're like, Barry, this was the most amazing content ever. And you're like, you're welcome. And they're like, would you, I, I just need more. Like, I would like to go deeper. Is there something else I could do? I'd like to learn more. I'd like some accountability. I really don't want to be separated from this community. I could really use some repetition till I get confident in it. I'd really love to be immersed in it. There's practices you've been talking about. I really love to model those, but I need to go deeper. And I mean, I get the theory, but I just, I really need some time to get it right, to build confidence in it. And you're like, nope, that's all I've got. Good luck. That's it. Like, no, of course not. Like, we're not here to do that. We're here to get people to take the next step. Not so that if you think about it, not, it's really not so that you make money. I guarantee you most people would put impact over income. We need income to survive. It's the easiest measuring stick for sure. But at the end of the day, especially when you start making money, you realize that like money is a shallow measuring stick, but impact is a really, really important one. It's if you could impact a lot of people by enrolling them, then wouldn't it feel good to make that available to them in a way that makes it super easy for them to say yes? And here's the key, not to say yes to you, to say yes to themselves. Hello, Launch Family. So happy to have you listening to today's episode. My name is Chris, and our topic of conversation today is... Uh, topic of events, live events, offers, sales, something very near and dear to my heart. Um, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Jeff Walker. Hey, folks. And we are also joined by our very special guest. She is the founder of Sage Event Management, strategic advice for growing events. She's a member of Jeff's Platinum Plus Mastermind Group and has been a big part of our own live events for many years. Barry Baumgartner, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, Launch Family, my favorite people. I love my Launch Family. So this is exciting. <laughs> This is very exciting. We're, we're excited to have you on the show. And uh, I know when we were crafting and thinking of people to bring on, we are we were very excited to have you be a part of this uh, of this podcast and uh, have you come on and speak. So I'm wondering, uh, could we maybe start with just you talking a little bit about yourself, your journey and uh, and who you are and your special expertise around events? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what's really interesting, Chris, is that I always say I started this business as a just until business. I started Sage Event Management 20 years ago from a bedroom in my house with literally a business card and a big idea. Like I distinctly remember thinking a business card was really, really important. Today, I don't even have one. I don't Gary a business card, but back then I was like, gotta have a business card. So I had a business card and a big idea. And it was a just until business because at the time, my husband that I was married to at the time was going through a really difficult time. His family business imploded. And when it imploded, he imploded. And I was like, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to pay our bills. I think someone's got to do something just until he gets back on his feet again. So my just until business was, I think I could start a business out of an extra bedroom in our house and, you know, I'll be an event planner just until he gets this all worked out. And then um, he sort of never did get it worked out. And my little idea went from part-time to full-time to having an employee to 20 years later, we have what is almost an eight-figure business, which is hard to believe. And I don't know, 15 full-time team and seven full-time developers that work on a software product we have. And, you know, it's crazy. I could never have imagined that 20 years ago. But... Yeah. I specialized in events because that was what I loved. That's what I knew. I'm like, what's one thing I know I'm good at? I know I'm good at live events. So that was my big idea. So I'm going to jump in here because Barry is someone I know very, very well. Uh, it, this podcast is going to be my opportunity to share many of my friends with you. And Barry is one of my very, very favorite people in this industry. And so Barry uh, has been working with me closely to grow our business. In fact, her business name, I, I wrote this down. So your business is Sage. It's strategic advice for growing events. And as I've told you in the past, Barry, I think it should be strategic advice for growing businesses because that's what Barry does. She helps people through the lens of live events, whether they're in-person or virtual, uh, craft a great offer, a great high-end offer, and then craft an event so it creates an amazing experience while also selling that event, or I'm sorry, selling your high-end offer in such a way where you're, it just becomes part of the event. And, you don't, and if you're not a great person at selling, 
this is perfect for you because it's built into the structure of the way they put together events. So we're gonna have a lot of fun on this and this call. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, some of my the yeah. best conversations I've ever had in this industry have been backstage with Barry, where <laughs> we're trying to figure out what to do next. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to say on stage? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I I, uh, I wanted to jump back to your story a little bit, Barry, because I think what was uh, interesting is you mentioned you're, you've built this big business now in seven figures and everything, but you said you started with it not even really sure what the idea was going to be, or you had an idea, but you weren't sure what the business was going to be. Uh, how, did, how did that emerge? How did you get from this concept of like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do to now, oh, this is what it is. This is where it's going to grow. Yeah, it's such a good question. I mean, I have to tell you, this is really interesting. When I first had this idea, I was really born out of necessity, right? Like I need to find a way to make money until my husband gets back on his feet. And I was qualified by saying, that's not my current husband, Blue. He likes for me to acknowledge that that is not my current husband, Blue. But anyway, um, my first husband, my, my yeah, my, my starter husband. Um, <laughs> and, you know, what's really interesting about it is that I just had this, I come from a nine to five dad. My dad fixed copiers for a living. My mom was a stay at home mom, worked really hard as a stay at home mom actually. And, um, you know, it just like, wasn't in my DNA. It wasn't like I came from an entrepreneurial family, but I'd been watching my husband's family and their entrepreneurial business. And I kind of started to connect the dots that everyone I knew in my life that had ever done really well and had a lot of money, had their own business. And I was like, well, I should start this, but I mean, you know, it's just until, because I, you know, clearly I don't know how to do this. I didn't go to school for this. And I remember walking around the neighborhood every day. My best friend, Christy lived across the street from me. And we would walk around the neighborhood doing our little exercise walk. And I was telling her this idea and she'd be like, you should do it. You can do this. I'm like, but I don't really know what to call it. She's like, we'll come up with the name. And I'm like, I've never done this before. And she's like, but if anybody can do it, you can do it. And like together we walked around the neighborhood and I was like, well, I don't want to call it like Baumgartner events. That's weird. I don't want to call it premier events. Everyone does that. I need a better name than that. And like, you know, I just never thought I'd, I would get this far. Like I grew up in Pocahontas village on Osage street, like this tiny little house on the, like literally the wrong side of the tracks. And the name of the street was Osage. They were all named after Indian tribes. And that was a, an Indian tribe. And she's like, you should call it Osage events. Like you've come such a long way from Osage street. And I'm like, well, I can't, that sounds like I'm Irish. I don't think I can do that. People might not get it. So then like, I'll drop the O and I'll call it Sage Events, and then I'll make it an acronym. And I think it could be strategic advice for growing events. I love giving advice. That's a great idea. And I mean, to Christy's credit, she's like, it is a great idea. And I always say, like, everybody needs a Christy. Like, the best thing that ever happened in my life was, was like Christy Norris saying yes to me. Because honestly, and many of you out there can probably relate to this. If Christy had said, that's a terrible idea. You can never do this. You know, you should really go to school for that. Like if she had told me it wouldn't work, I wouldn't have done it. I know that seems crazy, but I was that desperate for like confirmation and affirmation that this could work. And she's still one of my best friends. And I tell her all the time, like everybody needs a Christy in their life. And I was lucky I had one, but that's really how I got started. And I see today... And so many of our students, including the ones that we see in Launch Club and coming up through the ranks with PLF, is they want to have everything like so crystal clear before they get started. And I just want you to know if there's anything I know as an entrepreneur, it's that you do not have to have a crystal clear vision. You just have to get started. And ideally, you have a Christie <laughs> you <have a> <laughs> in your corner. <laughs> That's so important. Just like how many times do we get discouraged in our lives, right? Where we have ideas or concepts or things that we want to do and people are realistic, right? That that feeling of like, oh, be realistic or they they kind of turn down those ideas. But as you said, get a Christy, a cheerleader. When you find someone in that vein that can encourage you, that is such a huge, huge key to uh, to moving forward. And I'm sure uh, we've all had cheerleaders in our lives, our version of a, of a Christie. And if you haven't, I'm sure finding a, a Christie, some of those people in your lives who can be your cheerleaders is a, is a great move. Well, like really Jeff Walker picked up where Christie left off because at another point in my life where I was at a total crossroads, Jeff Walker became my cheerleader. So, mm. you know, um, it's good to have a cheerleader. It's really good when your cheerleader is Jeff Walker, even better. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. <laughs> well, uh, 
let's let's talk a little bit about events then, since that is you know Sage. It's it's your uh, from concept to what you do now. Um, what would you say is the state of live events right now? Because it's gone through a lot of stages in the last few years. There's been a lot of uh, conf- uh, things that have happened between COVID to having to you know go from a lot of in person events. I'm guessing right because you used to run a lot of those to then transitioning to virtual events exclusively for a while, and then now. I hear we're in this sort of space where there's a a mid ground of like people doing hybrid events and some people doing virtual, some people doing live events. I'd love to hear your perspective on like, what is the state of live events right now in the industry and and where are people at? So, you know what I think is cool. I think right now the state of the union is that we are in the democratization of live events, meaning that for the first time in a really long time, and I mean, I've been doing that. I've owned Sage for 20 years. Hard to believe it's been 20 years, but I was a planner for long before that. I'm not going to say how long, because then you might be able to put my age together. So I'm just keep that a secret. Let's just say a long time. And the key with the democratization is that when, you know, people were coming up through the ranks prior to COVID, if you wanted to host a live event, you had to get a hotel, you had to have a room block, you had to sign a contract, you had food and beverage liability, you might have rental, you had all this overhead before you'd even gotten started. And it kept so many like up and coming, amazing event hosts on the sidelines because they were so afraid of the liability because you were kind of in the red before you even got started. And then COVID came and, you know, we went from doing I mean, literally 40 to 50 in-person events a year. You can do the math on how many weeks a year there is and how many events that is. We were on the road nonstop. And then COVID hit and literally our world shut down. I mean, like in one week, like we got calls like postpone, cancel, postpone, cancel, postpone, cancel. And if you're in the kind of business we're in, postponement is like, we're not making that money back. We thought you'd do an event next year. So the fact that you just told us you're moving that one to next year really doesn't help us for this year. And we made this quick pivot to virtual. And I'm so glad we did because I think it helped to usher in, especially for our industry, the info marketing industry, this idea of democratization, because now you can literally do an event from your living room with no liability. Like if you have a computer, a TV and a Zoom account, you're in business and you can have a global event and you can do it from your living room. So, you know, who doesn't have a TV, who doesn't have a computer, who doesn't have a Zoom account? And, you know, the democratization piece also is like everyone's on Zoom right? It's, it's basically free. And whether you're a grandmother, whether you're a 10 year old, whether you're a teenager, 20s, 30, it doesn't matter where you are. You get Zoom. It's an easy platform to use. And so the fact that it's removed all the barriers to entry, I think is really powerful, especially for launch family. Because if you're out there doing launch and you're building your list and you're, you know, creating a product the leverage that you can get from taking that product and adding a live event. And the fact that now you don't have to get a hotel and you could do an event for, let's say 10 people show up and let's say five of them buy. And let's say the product was five grand. You just made $25,000 from your living room. You could start to do the math on how that could escalate. So I think we're in an awesome time and, you know, live events are never going to go away that I think of live events as in-person events and then virtual events as the home event or the studio event. I think they coexist together the same way that, you know, I can listen to Eric Church, you know, one of my favorite country music bands. I can listen to them like in surround sound in my house or out in my garden. And it's amazing. It sounds incredible because I'm married to Blue. and We have really great tech at our house. I still want to go to the concert, you know, like I still want the experience. And I think that's what we've got going on now is it's an and not an or. I can talk about hybrid if you want to, but I'll just say like, I think the most important thing to take away is that you can host a live event from your living room. Go team, go. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. It is. It is. I, I, well, that brings up a question for, for, for me, at least, is if I'm in business and I'm starting things off, I haven't run an event before. I love that idea that I can take this thing called Zoom that I've been, you know, I can basically access for free and run an event. But how do I know when I'm ready to do that or when I should do that? Or should I just go for it and try? And like, you know, what? how do I know that I'm ready to start doing an event versus some other thing? You're ready. Permission granted. You're right. (laughs) You know, but I mean, seriously, I think kind of like everybody needs a Christie. Sometimes you just need permission. If you have a list, if you have a basic idea of who you are and who you want to serve, if you have a basic framework, and if you're launching, you probably have these things or are working on these things, then adding a live event is the way to add serious leverage to your business. And, you know, so often I see, especially let's say you're a speaker, an author, a course creator, an influencer, 
and you have, you know, one to one, let's say you've been selling one to one, you're dialing for dollars, trading hours for money. And then all of a sudden you can add the leverage of one to many. Like it's a serious game changer. And probably the best example of this is us, is, is my business. So for 17 years, we ran an event business. We might say a successful event business doing in-person events. And we had not, we were, we had, we had just launched our first product. It took us three years to do this. It took us three years to get the Kahunas to launch our first product. We launched our first product on in-person events. And I kid you not, three months later, COVID hit. So pretty much right after our launch was done with our beta, it was over because you couldn't sell a product on in-person events because nobody was going to do an in-person event. So anyway, we thought, why don't we host our own virtual event? And so we did. Like we hosted our own live event, launched our own coaching program, and literally seven times, seven X, our net profit that year by doing that. So I, and I say that not to talk about myself. I say that because even for someone like me who knows live events, I mean, I was helping to run some of the best live events in the industry for 17 years. And I didn't do my own live event because I was nervous to do it. And I was forced by COVID and a good friend named Reed Tracy, who I know because of Jeff and the Platt Mastermind, um, to actually get out of my own way and do it. The big takeaway I had, and this is what a lot of event hosts have, is, man, I wish I'd done this earlier. Why didn't I do this earlier? And, you know, the thing is, you are ready. Like, if you have those basics in place, if you've, if you've dreamt it, you can do it. And it's, it's basically taking your course and doing it live. I would love to talk about that if you want to. Like, I think that's a big mistake people make is thinking it's new content instead of the same content done in a different way. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's what I was actually going to dig in on was like, uh, when you say it's, you know, what you're ready, um, what am I going to do at this event? And you must've been, I mean, one thing you mentioned at the very beginning was before COVID, it was a big risk in some ways to run an event. And part of why people would come to you is that you would make those, you know, people already in the red and you would basically help them get that to a very profitable place by crafting a great offer, great content, having a, a, I guess, a formula in some way to make this event a financial success. And when that all shifted in COVID, then it became, okay, we don't have the overhead, but you still have all that expertise. What are some of these things that we should be doing if I'm going to run that first event for it to be a tremendous success? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way I look at it is that, it's, it's funny, Jeff helped me figure this out. He said this earlier, but for years we said that we, you know, built live events. And he's like, you actually don't build live events, you build businesses. And then we took that a step further and we're like, for a long time, we were an event company who happened to do high ticket offers. And now I say we're a high ticket offer company who happens to do live events. And I really think that's a great way to look at this is that it's really about the high ticket offer. It's not about the live event, meaning that going back to this whole idea of the accordion. And if you, let's say you have let's just say a course since your launch family and you are launching your course and you've already come up with a body of work, like a basic framework that encapsulates your zone of genius. And now you're like, okay, I'm ready. I think I'm going to do this live event thing. I'm going to try this out. You basically would host, in my opinion, a three-day live event. I'll tell you why in just a second, a three-day live event. And you would launch your course the event is just an immersive version of your course and your high ticket offer is mastery of your course. So follow me on this for just a second. This is how I've started to think of our industry. Whatever you do for free, let's say challenge, webinar, core, uh, uh, podcast, um, launch, whatever you're doing free is to get your audience to think you can do that. Like it's an introduction. It's the introduction to your method. Like what? You can do that? I had no idea you could do that. Then once they start following you, they're like, well, wait a minute. Now that I hear more about this, I can do that. They actually make it their own. Like they start to get excited. I think now that I hear more about this, I could do this. That's where your course comes in. The course is the opportunity for them to learn your method. Now you're going to introduce them to your three-day live event experience. And this is where they experience your method. This is where they're thinking, I love this course content. It was amazing, but I just want to go deeper. And you're like, I thought you would. I happen to have a three-day experience where you can experience the method. We're going to go even deeper. And then at that live event, they're naturally going to think, if you design it right, this is so amazing. I want more. Like, I really want to go deeper on this. And you say... I thought you would. I happen to have a high ticket offer where you can master the method. So if you think of it as introduction to method, the method, 
experience the method, master the method. That's the buyer psychology. That's the journey that you're taking them on. And that journey is you can do that. Wait a minute. I could do that. Wait a minute. I will do that. Wait a minute. I must do that. That high ticket offer is way too good to pass up. And I'm crazy not to do that. Like when you really think about it, I'm crazy not to master this method. And so we break it down that simply you, the benefit of it is it's like you have to have a huge body of content. You already have the content. You're just allowing your buyer, your right fit client. I like to think of your buyer as your right fit client. You're allowing your right fit client to go deeper with you. And the deeper they go, the more they pay. So they're going to pay more for your course than they do for free. They're going to come to your live event and pay more for your high ticket offer than they did for your course because they're having more exposure to you. So it's pretty easy when you start to string it together that way. You're like, of course you're ready. You know, like how hard is it to put together a course? You can do that. How hard is it to put together an event based on the course? You can do that. How hard is it to put together a one-year program where you're going to coach them through your method? You can do that. So when you think about that, it's like, oh, wait, no, I am definitely ready to do a live event. And then you asked me like how you do it. Do you want me to talk about that? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can already see like there, there's clearly an emotional style of journey that's going through anyone who's going to an event uh, like this. And if I'm yeah. running my own um, from the big picture standpoint, I get the idea. But yeah, I'd love to hear more about like where are the, the tactics on like, OK, OK, I stretch my course out over day one. Sure. But like, what about what am I offering? How do I craft an offer? So, yeah, some of the tactical things might be great for people to to hear. Yeah. So I think like really high level, I personally believe a high ticket offer, any high ticket offer, doesn't matter whether you're selling it because you like to help dog trainers, or you help restaurateurs, or you help personal development, or you're in business development, doesn't matter what niche you're in. I think at the end of the day, your high ticket offer is two things. And I have an acronym. I'm a big fan of acronyms. So there's an acronym for that. Um, it's two things. The first is ACE, A-C-E. And the second is REM, R-I-M. ACE is the part of your high ticket offer that is accountability. People want accountability. If you think about it, I took your course, but I need to be accountable in order to go deeper, take it farther and master it. So I want to be accountable. Then I want a sense of C, community, like-minded community. And keep in mind, you know, I say this all the time, but it's so, so true. I see more and more of it every day. You can have the most amazing people in your life, spouse, family, friends, and they still might not be your like-minded community. People like you trying to do what you're trying to do. A tribe of Christies, let's say, right? Your like-minded community. And then E is enhanced opportunity to be more, do more, have more, and make more. So this is what you're selling in your high ticket offer. You're selling accountability, community, and enhanced opportunity to be, do, have, and make more. And by the way, if your personal development make might be make more love, make more light, you know, make more health. It doesn't have to be make more money. It's just the concept of make more of what you want. Then it's how you do it and how you do it is the rim piece. And to give credit where credit's due, I learned this from Tony Robbins. When I heard him explain what mastery was, he said, mastery is repetition, immersion, and modeling proven practices. And as soon as I heard it, I'm like, of course it is. That makes so much sense. If you want to master something, you have to repeat it, you have to be immersed in it, and you have to model a practice that's already proven. So that's REM, R-I-M. So what you do is ACE, and how you do it is REM. That's a high ticket offer. So now all you have to figure out is what's the right rhythm to take your right fit client through in order to give them accountability, community, enhanced opportunity, and repetition, immersion, and modeling proven practices. It could be a mastermind. It could be group coaching. could be monthly immersions, Q&A. Like there's so many ways, so many vehicles to deliver it. And I think that's infused by your own awareness of what you like doing and who you're serving and what would get them the outcome. Because, you know, at the end of the day, People don't buy trainings, they buy outcomes. They're buying an outcome. So what's the outcome that you're creating? And then what's the fastest path to get them there? So that's the part of the high ticket offer, okay? So then the next piece is like, how do you fit that into a live event? And to give credit where credit's due, because I like to do that, this idea came from two members in my Plat Plus Mastermind. They called me one day and said, hey, would you run us through that thing that you talked about at Plat Plus that was like, how do you, how's the three-day event formatted again? And I explained it. And they were Susan Garrett, most amazing dog trainer on the planet. If you have a dog, check her out. You've got to. I mean, like, seriously, she changed it. We have a little puppy and she changed our lives. She's so incredible. We're not the only ones. And um, Michael Maidens, also incredible coach in his own right. So they're on a call and I walk them through and they're like, oh, it's three things over three days. It's like a three by three. 
And I'm like, yeah, it's a programmatic layout. It's a PAG. Oh, it's a three by three PAG. So that's how that was born. So let me explain three by three PAG. So three by three PAG, I'm just going to do this super simple because I'm talking way too much. Um, three by three PAG is day one of your event content connection community. The only thing you have to do on day one of your event, give amazing content, create incredible connection to yourself, to the like-minded community. And this is most important, a connection to their sense of what's possible in the future, a sense of what, that they can do it and that they can actually see themselves doing it, that connection to that higher power, future casting. And then the last C is, um, uh, connection, wait, content connection community. So we've got amazing content, incredible connection to you and to themselves and to their future. And then a sense of a like-minded community. Those are the three C's. Okay. It's all you have to do on day one. Like your goal on day one is they leave and they're like, this was amazing. And I can't believe I have two more days. Like seriously, cause you want them to come back for the next two days. So you don't sell them anything. All you do content connection community. Okay. Day two more great content, more incredible connection, more incredible community. But you know what's going to happen? Like this is inevitable. doesn't matter how sophisticated or how smart your audience is. They're going to go from, wow, this was so amazing. I can't wait to start implementing this to, wow, this is a lot of stuff. I could use help implementing this. And you say, I thought you would. That's why I have the most incredible solution for you. So day two is problem solution invitation. What's the problem? You have a gap from where you want to be and where you are. Solution, I can close that gap. And the how is with my invitation, which is my high ticket offer. My high ticket offer will solve your problem. Go team, go. Would you like to invite me? Join me for a year in my high ticket offer program. And then day three is decision commitment celebration. That's the last three. Get them to decide to do something differently, commit to start right away and celebrate what it's going to look like when they get there. And the hook on that is if in making that decision, of when you're going to start and what you're committing to do and what you're going to celebrate, you realize that it would be so much easier to not do it on your own, to do it with the help of accountability, community, enhanced opportunity with repetition, immersion, and modeling proven practices, then decide to do it with us, commit to starting today. We're going to celebrate at a welcome celebration here today at the event. The program starts at the event. And literally, that is a three-day event model. Like you really don't need to make it any more complicated than that. Layer in your course, make it an experience. They will want more. Follow that trajectory. And literally you've launched your high ticket offer. I mean, sure, there's more details, but high level, that's how it works. If this was a, uh, if we had mics to drop, we would be dropping them right now, I think. <laughs> yeah, three that's mics so good. Thank yeah, you, that's Mike. always the experience. Yeah. Whenever Barry's speaking, it, it, you need mics to be dropping. Like, yeah. For sure, a hundred percent. So, Barry, <laughs> so, 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 I think. Um, yeah, let's see. We've we've been working together for a long time, Barry. Uh, since two thousand fifteen, yeah. we figured that out. So that's I think uh, probably I don't know somewhere near fifteen events that that you've helped me with, and so you've coached me and coached me and coached me. And, and I know one thing that I think might hold a lot of people back when they they hear about not only an event, but it's an event with an offer is like, I'm, I'm not a pitch man. I'm not a, I don't know. I, I'm not comfortable selling. I don't know how to sell. I don't. And, and, and people are, there's like a spectrum of people that like, let me out. And I just can't wait to make an offer. I live to make offers. But I think there's a lot more people that are probably on the other end of the spectrum and including, I would count myself as someone who is not a natural born salesman or, or a pitch man or a pitch person. Um, can you just talk a little bit because you've worked with so many people and you've, and some of them I know are natural, but most of them are. Can you just talk about like the, like the evolution of, of becoming comfortable with an offer and, and really what I'm digging at is, is how the, how the structure does the work for you. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. I mean, it's obviously really passionate about this and I love this topic and it's ironic that I ended up in an industry where I become known as the person who specializes in high ticket offers and helping people enroll people because I literally like quit Girl Scouts because I did not want to sell cookies. Like I'm like, I love the little outfits, love the badges, love the activities, hard no, hard stop on selling cookies, like not doing it. I mean, literally I quit. I was just like, I'm not doing that. Like no way. And I look back at that and I think if someone had told me, I wish someone had said, Barry, what's your favorite Girl Scout cookie? I'd be like, Thin Mints. 
like automatically, absolutely. Thin mints, best cookie ever made. Like, listen, all you have to do is say, would you like to try a thin mint? And they'd be like, sure. And then they'd taste it. Like, this is amazing. It'd be like, I know one box or two, right? Like I could have like literally been the best Girl Scout (laughs) ever. But no one told me it was that simple. And when I think of it, like, I honestly would love to banish the word pitch. I think it's a tough word, right? Like nobody wants to be pitch. No one wants to be the pitcher, unless you're in baseball, you don't want to be the pitcher. And, you know, you want to serve people. And I think, you know, Jeff, you and I have this in common, Chris, you and I have this in common. That's why we get along so well is we love serving people. And I think most of the people who follow us, if you ask them, do you want to sell someone? They'd be like, no. Do you want to serve someone like all day long? And so the first pivot is to really think of sales as a service. And that can sound trite, like, oh, okay. But really think of it as like you're enrolling people into something that they already want to do and you've got an easier way for them to do it. And then it's an invitation for them to come along with you. That's why day two is pain solution invitation, not pain solution pitch. It's like, I'm inviting you to join me on this journey where together we're going to do the work. Like only you can do the work, but you don't have to do it alone. And if you know you're meant to do it, why not start now? And if not this, what are you going to do? Like when you start to think about it that way, and I do like to think about this that way. Imagine that people come to your event and they're like, Barry, this was the most amazing content ever. And you're like, you're welcome. And they're like, would you, I I just need more. Like, I would like to go deeper. Is there something else I could do? I'd like to learn more. I'd like some accountability. I really don't want to be separated from this community. I could really use some repetition till I get confident in it. I really love to be immersed in it. There's practices you've been talking about. I really love to model those, but I need to go deeper. And I mean, I get the theory, but I just, I really need some time to get it right, to build confidence in it. And you're like, nope. That's all I've got. Good luck. That's it. Like, no, of course not. Like, we're not here to do that. We're here to get people to take the next step. Not so that if you think about it, not, it's really not so that you make money. I guarantee you most people would put impact over income. We need income to survive. It's the easiest measuring stick for sure. But at the end of the day, especially when you start making money, you realize that like money is a shallow measuring stick, but impact is a really, really important one. And so if you could impact a lot of people by enrolling them, then wouldn't it feel good to make that available to them in a way that makes it super easy for them to say yes? And here's the key, not to say yes to you, to say yes to themselves. And I think a lot of people get this wrong. They're working so hard to sell the person without realizing, and this is like really critical in enrollment theory, If people are not enrolled in themselves, there's no chance they're enrolling in you. And that's why day one of a live event is about that future casting piece of that connection to their future self of what is possible. Because once we see where we want to go and once we see where we are, we can't help but see the gap. Like once we see it, we can't unsee it. And once we see it, we want to close it. And so if they're enrolled in that sense of what they want to do, then they start looking for how to get there faster. And that's where you come in. So your first job is actually to enroll them in themselves. Your second job is to show them how you're the fastest path to get there. And when you start to look at the logic of that buyer psychology, you're like, oh, of course I'd want to do that. And then I think about like going to Costco, like my favorite thing to do on it is like, if you're going to go to Costco, you're going to go on a Saturday, right? Of course. Why? Because they got the snacks out and everybody wants snacks. So you go with your cart, you've got your list and you're like, I'm going to go get these 10 things, but you know what happens. Like you're not even like to aisle two. And someone's like, would you like to try this? And it's just like the Girl Scout cookies. You're like, I sure would. And you try it and you're like, this is amazing. And like, I know one box or two. And I think about the fact that like you are Costco, you've got all this stuff on your shelves and someone at Costco on a Saturday has to decide which things they're going to put at the end of the aisle. Like they don't put every product out. They put the ones out that they know are most likely to attract the right fit customer and get them to say yes. Right? So your job in making a high ticket offer, putting together your course, putting together your content, putting together your, any content you're putting out there really, whether it's free or low ticket or high ticket is what am I pulling off my shelves? to make it easy for the customer to be like, oh, I can see myself in the kitchen serving that. I will look amazing. You're not actually buying how good that thing is. You're buying like how great it's going to be when your family is like, this is amazing. Your friends say, this is amazing. You're highly enrolled in the outcome, which is I can have an incredible experience without having to work hard at it, right? 
Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing we're doing with our high ticket offer and what we have to do from a sales and service perspective. So what are the things that you can pull off your shelves and put in front of your customer and get them to sample it that would have them go, that's amazing. I want more. And you'd be like, I thought you would one box or two, right? Like that's a natural evolution to the next thing, whether it's low ticket event, high ticket. And it doesn't feel icky, salesy or sleazy because you believe in it. You know, it works. You just wanted to get them to taste it. And once they did, you knew they'd want more. And of course you'd have more waiting for them because you'd be crazy not to like, who does that to somebody? Like, here's something great. Nope. You can't have any, you know, Barry. That's so, uh, <laughs> Chris, Chris, I'm just going to tell you a quick story <laughs> because the first event I ever did, Barry, what was in 2007 and I, it was a three-day event. My theory was I'm, I was going to use the videos to become my next course, my next version of PLF. And I had no offer. There, there, was, no, there was no offer. They just came to the event. It was a high dollar. I charged $5,000 for it. And my thinking was I can't, I, well, I didn't even conceive of a high ticket offer at that time. Um, and, and by the second day, people were asking, like I had, my staff, the total team staff was two people, but people were asking them, is Jeff going to offer something? And they're like, no. And then Sunday morning, day three, I, I'm in the elevator going down to the event room and a couple of attendees step in. And one of them's like, are you going to, is there going to be some kind of an offer? And I was like, no, what are you talking about? No. And there wasn't. And they were like bummed or, you know, some subset of them were bummed that there wasn't an offer. So, yeah. Little little Jeff anecdote from the old days. Yeah, the, because there wasn't an opportunity. Like offers are opportunity, right? So what we're really saying in that is like, I would like another opportunity to get better at this. Are you going to offer that? And you're like, no, 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 I'm not. See you next year. You know, and I think about that and think that's why you're ready now because, you know, we have this saying like to every third grader or fourth grader is a hero. Whatever information you have right now is more than the person behind you has. And as you start to serve them, you're going to figure out more about what you're good at and where your secret sauce is, your zone of genius, and how you can better help people. But nobody helps people in isolation. Like it sounds obvious, but so often, especially in our industry, because we love being online, we can kind of hide behind our computers and do all these things. But it's like, you know, you don't really figure out how good you are until you start doing it. You don't really feel, figure out your method until you start doing it. So when you wait to get it perfect and you don't put it out there, you never get it perfect. Like there's no chance of you getting it perfect if you don't get started. Like that's the thing, right? And and, it, and there is no such thing as perfect. That's another like big, you know, myth that we tell ourselves is when it's perfect. And once you finally realize that like perfect is not a destination, it's a journey, then you're freed from all of that. It makes it so much easier to get out of your own way. And I say this having waited three years to do a lunch because I wanted it to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and so many times people like you said, there's a percentage of people who are going to show up to our events that are actually looking for the solution you're providing, right? Yeah. We don't sure. know which ones know they are. Get there. It's like Costco. You didn't come there looking for it and then you got it. You're like, wait, no, I need that. Yeah. Well, and, and I think there is, there's people who are going there and there's a small percentage of probably looking for it going there. But then there's a larger percentage of people that would 100% be open to that and excited about it. If you told them about it and made it possible for them to do, right, like sign up for your uh, high-end offer. And then there's a whole bunch more people who, if they get into this event and get exposed to the formula that you're talking about, the content, the opening of the, the, the opportunity to them and showing them where they could be, then that they become interested and eventually committed to that new frame of their future. And that's where that high-end offer kind of comes in. And there is, as you mentioned, a cost to not actually joining for them as well. It's something I think a lot of people forget is that people come there looking for solutions or hoping that their life will be better after this event. And one of the ways in which they can have their life be better is by enrolling into this uh you know, high ticket offer uh, that is a solution for them, right? And provides real value and actually does help them through that transition or transformation that you're offering, whatever industry that is. Well, the hardest thing to learn is the difference between cost and opportunity cost. Like, you know, cost is an expense, right? And opportunity cost is one of those 
regrets where you're like, oh, I missed the multiplier. It would have cost me 10,000, but I would have made a hundred. I didn't buy it because it cost 10, but I missed the part where I was going to make 90, you know, or whatever the number is. Right. And, you know, I think the key to a, a really, to anything you're selling really, to any kind of enrollment theory is that there can't be a bait and switch. Like if you run a launch and people don't buy the product, you don't want them to leave thinking that just sucked. Like I didn't buy it. it. You know, the only reason Jeff had that launch was to sell me that product launch formula. I got no, it turns out all he wanted to do was pitch me that formula. Like Jeff is so amazing. When you watch product launch formula, when you watch the cha- the launch, you're like, oh my God, that I learned so much. Like, even if you really can't afford it or you're really not ready for it, you don't leave thinking that was a waste of my time. You leave thinking that opened up a whole portal to me that I didn't even know existed. Like you can do that. Wait a minute. I could do that. I will do that someday. So that's the key. Like there's no bait and switch. We gave generously, whether it's the launch or it's the live event. Like if people come to your three day, they ought to really leave. Even if they don't buy feeling really well served because today's non-buyer is tomorrow's buyer. Like whoever doesn't buy today, if you gave them an amazing experience is likely to come back again and again until they're ready. And honestly, to bring other people with them when they come back, like we call it rave, renew, recruit. Like that was so amazing coming back. I'm going to do it again. I'm actually going to recruit other people to do it with me. So for some of us who, you know, to Jeff's original question might feel weird about selling really when you think of serving, when I think of an audience, like let's say I have a hundred people in an event. I never think a hundred people are going to buy a product. Like I've never seen an event where hundred percent buy the product. It's really, really rare, but the percentage who do are the ones who really wanted to go deeper with you. And the ones who don't are the ones like, I feel really well served. This was an incredible event. I can't wait for next year. And the ones who really wanted to go the distance with you, to go down that journey with you for accountability, community, enhanced opportunity, repetition, immersion, modeling proven practices, you know, for those people, they are elated that you made that opportunity available. They might be scared. They might be nervous. It might've been a financial stretch. It might've been hard to convince their spouse, but they're glad they did it. And they're even more glad that you made the opportunity available so they could do it. And then when they have that transformation, they're going to be even more glad that you made it available and that they said yes to themselves first and you second. Like, that's what I like to hold a space for. Like anytime I'm worried about sales, I think about the transformation and I'm like, how could I not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. And, and just, you gotta let people have the opportunity and let them, you know, see themselves in that bigger position. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, a few things actually just recently, which I think we should dig into around like, well, it might've been hard to find the money. It might've been hard to convince my spouse or, you know, discover the time in which to commit to a program or whatever these things. And these are uh, what we would call objections or concerns or questions, right? Before they make that commitment to, uh, to say, join a program or that bigger future, the commitment to themselves. So uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to that in terms of where do those types of things show up in this process and how do we handle objections as they go through uh, making, a, making an offer like this? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think I'm really good at this because I'm the most cynical buyer. Like I really am. Like I think the world is divided into two types of buyers, like emotional buyers and logical buyers. Emotional buyers are the ones who like my husband's an emotional buyer. Like Blue Melnick has never met an offer he doesn't like. Like if he's in your audience, he's buying the product. Like he's the guy buying stuff online in the middle of the night, right? Like he's never met an offer he doesn't like. Before he's even heard the whole offer, his credit card's out. He's at the back of the room. And I'm the one who literally will like you know, even if I'm buying a car, I know they're not going to change the contract. I will still make the salesperson sit there while I read every word of every page and ask all the questions, you know, like the most logical buyer. And so therefore the most cynical buyer. And you kind of have, first of all, remember that your audience is that it's made up of both. Some people say it's 50, 50. I, I think I've come to think, I think it's 30% emotional, 70% logical. I think they're more logical buyers than emotional. And I think maybe even now in the world, based on what's going on, I think people really skew to the logical. And so you have to hold a space for the logical buyer and know that it's not about you. 
It's about them working through their process. And so the minute we're triggered by them not immediately saying yes versus going, oh, I recognize you. You're a logical buyer. You need a minute. How can I help you? Like, really, how can I help you? Like, this is service. Like, and you know, I always think like, I'm genuinely curious. Like, what are you, what are you questioning? And so if you come at it from a place of curiosity and not from the intensity of, I have to enroll them, I have to sell them. Like, if you just let that come over you, it's so much easier to be like, so and I think there's three magical words in this. Tell me more. Like someone says, I don't have the time to do it. You're like, interesting. Tell me more about that. Like, don't you want to know? I mean, I'm genuinely curious. Like it's a continuum. Like if you think about time, it's a continuum. On one end of the continuum is, well, um, I don't know. I might have to do that. Like after I put the kids to bed or may have to do that on Saturday, or I might have to like skip the gym one day. If I'm going to do that, that's one end of time. And the other is like, I'm working three jobs. I'm barely putting my food on the table. I've got, you know, young kids and I have an elderly parent I'm taking care of. Like those are both time objections, but they're radically different. And so I always want to know, like, where are you on the time continuum? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's true of money. I think the next logical one that, that a logical buyer is going to question is I can't afford to do this. And I think right below that one is spouse. Like typically my spouse, my partner, my significant other won't let me do this. Um, that's one of my favorite soapboxes. We could go there if you want to. Um, and then, you know, the next one's fear. Like I'm afraid to do it. Um, I, and the next one's like, I'm, I'm a little ashamed. I'm wary to do it. I've self-doubt around doing it. And I, I do think there's a pecking order in this, like time, money, spouse, fear, shame, and self-doubt. And you know, interestingly, when I first got in this industry and I didn't really know sales and no one taught me sales and I'd be helping at the back of the room and you, you know, someone would make an offer from the stage and you get the stampede to the back and you'd be answering all the questions. And so I started this spreadsheet and it was like tracking all the questions I get. And we do a lot of events. And so every time we did events and I got a question, I'd like log it in. And I'm not talking about the specifics, like, you know, when do I have, to, when's the date to decide or how much does it cost? I'm talking about the more philosophical questions. And as I started tracking them, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. It just was like literally like pages and pages long. Like I should organize these into buckets. And so I started putting them in buckets and I just started to get to the conclusion that there were five universal buying objections, any niche, any market, any language, doesn't matter. And we've tested this out in different languages, different markets, different niches. It all came down to, if you really look at an objection, I guarantee you it's going to fall into time, money, spouse, fear, shame, or self-doubt. Like, and in that order, you know, time's the easiest to talk about. We're not that worried to go, oh, I wish I could, I don't have time. We're a little bit like, you know, maybe even a little shame around, you know, I, I wish I could, I can't afford to do it. We're even more nervous to say, or like maybe even embarrassed to say, you know, I would do this, but my spouse won't let me like the whole permission thing. And then buried beneath that, like fear, like I, I didn't want to admit this, but you know, if I'm being really honest, I'm afraid to do it. Like, I'm afraid. What if it doesn't work? What if I don't work? What if the dream is dead? What if I try to do it and it fails? Then this is the only thing that's been holding me together. Then, you know, and then shame and self-doubt is below that, but it controls most of our decisions. Like, even though it's the last one, it's the one that it's the one that's hardest to talk about. It's the last one, not because it's not present. It's the last one because it's the hardest to get people to admit that why they really aren't buying, they might say it's time or say it's money or say it's their spouse or say they're afraid, but what really is controlling them is I'm ashamed because I made a bad decision at some point. I tried and I failed at some point. I invested and the person didn't show up the way I expected, or I didn't show up the way I was expecting. And so because of that, I feel a sense of shame and self-doubt. And I think, you know, if you go back to sales as a service, if someone's trapped in one of those five things and you can help them overcome that and get past it and say yes to themselves. And again, not yes to you, yes to themselves. I think that's like, I mean, I, I say, I really believe it's God's work. Like, I don't say that lightly, that not being trite. Like, I think that is God's work. I think it is a service to help people get out of being behind one of those objections and being stuck forever. And you know, it's interesting. Like if I use PLF live as an example, I had the honor of doing so many of them with Jeff and with the team, with you and the team. And you get the luxury of coming back year after year. And so what would happen is somebody would come up to you and be like, Hey, do you, do you remember me? 
I mean, it, sometimes I didn't always, there were a lot of people that came through that event, but they'd be like, you helped me last year decide to really go for it. And I did launch club and my spouse was not really on board. If I'm being really honest, I remember talking about how afraid I was and you helped me get past that and do it. And I've got to tell you, like, you wouldn't believe what happened to me this year. Like you wouldn't believe how well I'm doing. And, you know, it's like, if we hadn't helped them get past that obstacle, they'd still be stuck in that obstacle. So that's why I think it's really important to be okay with helping them face their objections. And nine times out of 10, you have to face yours first. Like, whatever is your trigger is going to be the one that shows up the most and torments you when you're trying to overcome objections. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I love that. And I love that. Well, even just the, the first thing you even said way back, as we talked for a bit, but was just like, can you tell me more? Not immediately yeah. writing the story for you, right? Like let them tell you what the story is in their mind about this objection, because how easy is it for as someone who's worked with a lot of salespeople for salespeople who maybe have heard a couple stories and then they insert that story into the person they're talking about and um, being patient enough to not write those stories ahead of time and be curious instead to dig in on those stories and find out where those objections really live. Cause it might be a time objection, but as you mentioned, it might not be a time objection. It might actually be, Oh, well, it's actually more my spouse or it might not be the spouse. It might actually be, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I'm worthy of doing this. And that's where, as you've mentioned, if somebody's stuck in that, deep of a level. It's almost like therapy. It's like getting to that root problem emerging and having gone through that process with a number of people on the sales side, I can say it's really, really satisfying when people do come out of it on the other side of it. And there's gratitude for having gone through that process. And I always say this to co to coach sometimes salespeople is uh, we have all the context. We've been in the programs. We've worked with the people who have had the transformation. We've seen people who have gone through all the other side and come out of it better and in that place of gratitude. And if they knew that, if they had that experience, would they, wouldn't they be saying yes? And sometimes our job as, um, you know, salespeople or as really, you know, the, the people who are helping them, it's, it's about getting them that information and that emotional buy-in because they just don't know what they don't know. And, uh, and it really is satisfying on the other side of it. It is. Yeah. It's a great work to be doing, I think. And listen, sometimes it goes the other way, meaning someone will say, you know, I'm really not, I don't think I'm ready to do this. And I know sometimes I've even said, Hey, you know, what? I don't think you're ready to do this. We've talked for a little bit. I'm thinking maybe this isn't right. Mm. And when you do that, they'll either be like, no, wait, I mean, I, I can do this. I am going to do this. Like, great, then let's get you signed up. But sometimes you'll have this sense of like, just you'll see this total relief wash over their body and like, oh no, I'm, I'm, thank you for helping me through this. I'm really not ready to do it. And you have to be okay with no, right? Like it may not be their time, but the number of people that also came up to me at a future event would say, do you remember me? I'd be like, you helped me last year decide it wasn't my time, but here's the thing. I've been working on this all year and I came back this year and this year's the year. Like this year is launch club. This year I'm doing it. And you have to hold a space for both. Like our job is to coach, the, I think, coach them to the solution that's right for them. Knowing that even if it's no, you're protecting the integrity of the purchase, of the investment, of the conversation. And they're highly highly likely to come back later and say yes. I mean, it's never a salesperson's job to just close everybody or sell everybody. Cause I think yeah. that's a misperception of what a salesperson does, but a salesperson's role is to help people make the right decision for them today. And if it's not the right decision for them to join today, I'm happy to get them to that decision because I don't want people in the program where it's the wrong decision for them to be in that program. Um, and also when we do get them to that decision, it may not be today that's the right decision. Maybe it's next year, like you said, when they've reached that, that place where they're at that space, they're ready. Or two yeah. years or three years. I mean- I had someone join my program recently that have been like to six of our events and been following us for five years, you know, I, and they'd probably known us for a decade. But the thing is, you know, it's, um, 
it has to be the right time for them. And we're in the, you know, I think most of us, I know you guys are, we are in this business for the long game. And so if you're in it for the long game, you don't have to be threatened by not closing the sale today. Like, I feel like if I served you well by giving you great content, helping to change your life through the course or the, the, the launch or the event or whatever it is. And you know, I, you left feeling better about yourself and better about me and better about what's possible. That's part of the work I'm here to do. And if I actually got you the whole distance to get you to say yes to joining the coaching program, then we get to do the rest of the journey together, which is really exciting, you know, but you're holding that space for what's possible. And when you come at it from that place, you don't have to feel icky because it's all about the service. And, you know, I'll just throw out there. There's a fine line between empathy and enabling too. Like, you know, you can go too far on it, right? Like our job is to empathize with them, but it's not to enable them to stay stuck forever. You know, it's a fine line. I have a story that I want to explore that I think that only the three of us can talk about. And that's, so first of all, we do have, I, my company, we have this program called Launch Club and that's our high ticket offer. And that's where we go that that's where we're going to mastery on launching and it's amazing and it's awesome. And what is that generally not known is that in circa 2015, when I wanted to create a high ticket offer, I had Barry and her husband blue come out to my secret headquarters in Durango. And we basically created it there. We, we, we built the plan for launch club there. And I think that was 2015. And then a few months later, we made we, we did Peel Off Live that Barry and Blue and Sage helped us with. And we made the offer for Launch Club and instantly we had this program. Uh, within, uh, I don't know, within less than a year, I think we were closing in on 300 members in this program. And it was awesome. It's, it's just a fantastic program. But then somewhere in there, Chris came on board. And Chris, what year was that where you were first out? Yeah, it was. I was the second time you had, or third time you had offered Launch Club. So it was probably a year in, I think, to Launch Club being existent, or it was like the, they were doing their first renewals, I feel like. And and so, so probably let's, 2016. Let's just tell that story. Okay, let's call it 2016. Let's talk, talk about that, the story of your first, because what what we did, what we would do with our events back then is I would make the offer, but throughout the event, we would allow people to meet with one of our coaches and we called it the launch pad. And they were, they offered some coaching and they generally would, I don't know how they, they would make the offer or they would talk about the offer. Actually, the time was complicated. It was after I made the offer on stage, then they would start to talk about the offer in launch pad. And we would do hundreds of these launch pad appointments and Chris, why don't you take it from there and talk tell us about your your first well, ever? Yeah, well, it was it was interesting because when I came on the team, I know my role was not 100% set in stone what I was going to be doing. You just kind of knew I would be involved in sales. And so uh, and from what I had been told, we had great coaches, but we didn't necessarily had coaches that were great at enrollment. And so I was coming in to kind of be the person who knew a little bit about enrollment and help through that process. And yeah, people would come into this launch pad and we would give them essentially a preview of coaching and try to create an aha moment in a 10 minute kind of conversation with them. And then there would be uh, a little bit of information on Launch Club. And I, we would be going through the the process that Barry outlined earlier in this episode. And at one point, we would have an invitation. And uh, these would be hundreds of these appointments booked, right? And after the invitation was where we would get a lot of people coming up to the back and we would be having people come in and do all the uh, do all the, uh, the the sales stuff. And then on the Sunday morning, people would be showing up the next morning, lined up around to talk about Launch Club and answer questions on it. And so we would get very, very busy in the early morning on Sunday. And then the Saturday evening, we would have a lot of people coming up and asking questions about the offer. But prior to that, it was all mainly coaching. And my experience was, I, I, I think coming into that, I would walk around to each of the coaches and sort of shadow them for day one and day two. And what was interesting is they, they didn't want me to actually do any appointments, but then we got busy and we started doing, you know, like, Hey, we're getting really busy. Do you mind doing an appointment? Cause we we've got a little overflow. We just want to make sure we get, get through everybody. And I've been watching everybody do this and they're great coaches. They weren't really <laughs> into the sales thing. Um, but I thought 
I could probably sell one of these. And I was very new in the company, so I felt like I needed to do it. So I sat down with somebody, his very first appointment, and it was this gentleman, Michael Walker, who I will just say was uh, some of you might know him from our community. He's made a lot of waves since he uh, joined into Launch Club, but uh, we were both kind of nervous sitting down together because I was nervous in my first appointment ever doing this. And he was nervous because he wasn't sure where he wanted to be uh, in his in his life in the next year or two. But I could tell he was at the point where we were talking about where making a decision now was the right thing for him to do. And he was in this place of He saw the opportunity. He knew he wanted to go a little deeper with this and he was ready. And so, and I didn't have the time limits everyone else did because they were just like, just take this person. So I spent a little extra time with him, went over Launch Club and helped him make the decision to join up for Launch Club in that moment. And uh, I remember him being very excited and gracious and excited to join in. But uh, Michael Walker has since now in my very first appointment with him, now grown his business over that first year to another year to another year. I think he's been in Launch Club every single year since then. And I mean, he's now in the seven figure and a fellow member in Platinum Plus Mastermind with you as well, with his business partner as well. And um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's amazing to think back on that very first appointment and the doubts and questions he had initially about even where he could go and what he could do had never launched, had never done anything in online business. He had some following from his music, but had never really identified an ideal client or a lead magnet or any of those things, but was willing to kind of take that leap in that moment to jump into the program because he knew at that moment he had a bigger opportunity ahead of him than behind him. And um, yeah, it was a very, very important formative moment I know in his business to go into that program. And, uh, and also for me in joining this company, <laughs> it was pretty formative too, because I was like, all right, I could do this. I could actually uh, help them bring great people into this community. And I felt great about it from then. So um, that was the story of Michael Walker, my first appointment. <laughs> yeah. And so first of all, Michael Walker is no relation to me. Um, and oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no we always have to qualify that, yeah, right? There, there's, there's so many yeah, my very the- first appointment, I sold Jeff's brother. Into- he was the easiest one. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, easiest sell ever is, is is no, because Michael has built a multi-million dollar business. But when Chris when when Chris spoke to him, Chris, he was a musician. He was a very successful musician, a touring musician. You could say he was a rock star, but he'd never done anything in his life besides be a musician. And I remember like Chris, you and he went through that launch pad. He signed up right away with. Yeah. Right away. And then that, yeah, that evening, that was Saturday of that live event that evening, we, we did an an evening session and I would take, um, I, I, I would do this little funny channeling thing where I would, take volunteers from the, from the audience. And I would sort of walk through what a launch could look like for them and and the messaging around that. And I would just pick random people. And one of the random people I picked out of, I don't know, there must've been six or seven or 800 people in the audience happened to be Michael Walker. I didn't know him at the time. I didn't know Chris had talked to him. I did know he had joined launch club because he had this big lanyard around his neck that said launch club. And when he told, this is, this is an interesting thing I've learned about sales is that when he told me like what his idea was, which was like teaching piano, even though he had no audience and he had, it, and I, and he's taught, he's telling this to me. And I'm like, wow, this is going to, I see he's joined launch club and I'm committed to getting him his investment back many times over in the next year. But this is going to be a tough one. It's like, how are we going to figure this out for him? And, you know, here we are. He came in and just, crushed it and it's a multi-million dollar business now when you know been in launch club yeah changed and, his life forever and you're changing all those musicians lives forever all the people he's helping like it's yeah. amazing what yeah, he's done yeah. yeah i mean and his journey through the first year was fascinating too we should get him on sometime yeah <laughs> yeah we, oh yeah we, for sure that's a great yeah. interview michael walker is a great interview yeah just to clarify his niche he doesn't teach piano what he does is he teaches musicians how to grow followings yeah and i was thinking that he shared this from stage so i don't think i'm betraying a confidence but i'm pretty sure that he like didn't tell his wife he joined yeah. like he kept it a secret <laughs> right 
And that's that great example of spouse, right? Like, you know, I don't have the money to do this. I'm afraid to tell my spouse to do it, but he believes so deeply. And Chris must have had a really amazing conversation with him. But I mean, seriously, like to help him see what was possible, he's like, I'm going there, you know, and then she'll see. And I think she's probably pretty glad he joined Launch Club. <laughs> no, it was definitely something that it did. The spousal objection did not come up in that conversation, but I think he handled it himself because, yeah, he did hold off on telling her, I think, until his second year joining <laughs> Launch Club, where he had built something out and had some real momentum and progress going for him. But uh, we don't always recommend that. That's not the way we encourage it to happen. But um, it worked out really, really well for his uh, for his story. And, uh, yeah, one of our, uh, one of, yeah, it's, it's just it, weird to think back on, it, on the first appointment I ever did now being in plat plus, it's such a cool journey to see. <laughs> yeah. He's just, he's become a star in our community and in the, the practical form of the community. And just to, for context, plat plus is our, my highest end mastermind, Barry and blue are in it. You, the minimum to get in is multi-million dollar business, many eight-figure businesses, some nine-figure businesses um, in, in the group. It's very limited. It's very difficult to get in. So for him to go from showing up at an event without even an idea to talking to Chris to where he's come, is just it's just crazy. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. But also what's possible in this industry, like that's what I love about the business that we're in is that you can take a business card and a big idea, you know, you can take this idea of what you're good at and helping other people and change your life, change future generations of your family and change the lives of all the people you're helping. Like, really, it's pretty amazing that we get to do this for a living, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And to be thinking that he was going to do a piano and then completely shift over that year through actually working with uh, our program, right? Because, I mean, how long could that have journey been without the the guidance and help, right? So I think being able to uh, to be confident that if you're out there questioning, do I have a program? Do I have something of a high ticket offer that I can offer? You do. You can create these transformations and it doesn't have to be perfect in their idea, even this is a theme for our whole episode, Barry, you didn't have the perfect idea of what your business was going to be when it started, but through engaging and getting out there, finding your cheerleaders, your Christie's for finding the people that um, can help you and guide you through those decisions that you need to make. You can figure it out to find uh, where, where that transformation for them can be and where they can land is uh, can be a pretty amazing and epic place <laughs> a year or two years or five years down the line because of those conversations or those events you're running now. Hey, Launch Family, Chris coming at you. We'll get back to our events conversation with Barry in just a minute. But first, I wanted to let you know what's in our Dare to Launch bonus ball for you this week. Barry is an expert at handling a variety of objections that you might hear from your clients. And you've probably already heard her do that in the episode. So Jeff and I had her go through handling two of the most common and probably the biggest objections you'll hear when dealing with your clients. The first one is, They need to talk to their spouse. The other one is, I don't have the money for this. I'm sure you've heard that before. So uh, Barry totally crushes it (laughs) and has a number of mic drop moments during this extra 20 minutes that we have in the bonus vault for you. I think you'll really dig it. So in order to access it, go to daretolaunchshow.com forward slash taco, enter your email, and you'll get access to the bonus conversation with Barry. But you'll also get access to all of our other show bonuses and any other goodies that we put in there. That website, again, is daretolaunchshow.com dot com forward slash taco to get access to our bonus vault. Now let's get back to this impactful conversation. This might be a great time for a two minute taco break. <laughs> what, yeah. what, what do you yeah. think? <laughs> yeah. I sensed the taco yeah. was coming. I felt like that was going. Um, so with the two minute taco break, what we do here very is we uh, ask some taco related questions and uh, there's no wrong answers, but uh, sometimes there's some wrong answers. So we'll see um, as we go through. We start off at a mild level and we go steadily spicier. You'll see how it goes. All right. So let's start off with a nice mild uh, taco question. Would you say uh, hard shell or soft shell tacos? Stop shop. All right. That is the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no right or wrong, but there's, 
There is one Taco wrong answer. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no judgment. I mean, Taco Bell, crunchy tacos. That was one of my gateway drug into, into tacos. Sure. So. Oh my gosh. It's, it's so funny. Like, who tacos. doesn't love Taco Bell? I still love Taco Bell. Don't tell anybody, but I still love Taco Bell. Uh, so uh, would you prefer a spicy or a mild taco? Spicy. All right. Uh, now, what about, let's do something a little more adventurous. If you, would you rather go, all right, would you, if you could eat a taco anywhere in the world, where would you eat it? My first thought was Paris. Cause like my favorite place to go, but I don't really think I do tacos in Paris. <laughs> so I'm feeling like Cabo a tacos in Cabo. Sounds good to me. A taco, taco in Cabo. Cabo. I like the way that sounds too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, uh, Jeff, you can jump on on this one, too. But would you rather go on a thrilling taco recipe hunting adventure in a deep sea submarine or a hot air balloon soaring above the clouds? Oh, my God. I'm so claustrophobic. I would never go in a submarine. <laughs> like, you couldn't even pay me to go in a submarine. Definitely hot air balloon. Tacos in a hot air balloon. Awesome. How about you, Jeff? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to join very on the hot air balloon. <laughs> all right. No, well, no, no yeah. submarines. <laughs> um, all right. How about this? Uh, if you could have a taco themed superpower, what would it be? Oh, I'm going to let Jeff go first on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, to uh, a taco, to be able to handle any, any spice level uh, of mm. hot sauce. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, you can take all the hot ones, spices right to the end. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, like you know, we one. did, well, we, we, we did that at Barry at your house. We went with, um, with my team. We were doing a party at your house after event a couple of years ago. Yeah. We broke out the blue, broke out the really hot stuff. That oh, was, wow. That was oh, yeah. That, that is Blue Loves Hot Ones. Like, that sounds like something Blue would do, for sure. Uh, he makes his own special hot sauce. It's amazing. And, you know, really what's amazing is his spicy margarita. Like, if you like spicy things, the spicy margarita is not to be missed. Yeah. I'd take that with my taco. That sounds good. How about you, Barry? Any uh, super taco-themed superpower? My taco theme superpower is that like I could take any ingredient and turn it into something amazing. How about that? Does that I like work? That. Like, I think that might be my zone of genius. <laughs> I could take any ingredients and turn it into something really mm. awesome. I like that. That's very cool. Uh, <laughs> how, how about this? Maybe this will be a little bit more on brand, but if you were to run a live event for a taco loving community, what kind of high end taco product would you offer? Oh my gosh. Like it'd be like tacos live or something <laughs> like live event taco. Um, what kind of high ticket offer product would it be? I mean, like how to, how to like start your own taco Ooh, business. There we go. I mean, that's not super creative. I mean, how to like a taco world tour, like the best taco. Oh my God. I love oh, that. There we taco go. Taco world tour. <laughs> yes. Definitely taco tacos world tour. around the world. That's right. Oh, no. So here's something I've always wanted to do. I've actually always wanted to do a live event, like a virtual live event called Chasing the Sun. And it's like 24 hours and you start right and you go around the world. And so what if everyone had to do like some special taco thing in different parts of the world and we chase the sun? So that's my taco global event. Like definitely that. That sounds that, awesome. That's, I, I'm already excited about that event. <laughs> You can have different info marketers in different parts of the world sharing their taco recipe and some secret sauce. Oh. Get it right? Like you'd have some secret. You could sauce. even go where they picked certain <laughs> parts of the taco, and then like you could go to yeah. where they make the taco. It's like, oh, I could see that. You can see every part of it. I think we're onto something, <laughs> and it could be a fundraiser. Mine's going to be a fundraiser. We're going to chase the sun and um, get influencers to share their tacos and their secret sauce and um, fundraise for a really good awesome. cause. Awesome. I like it. I love that. All right. Very cool. <laughs> that was our two minute taco break. <laughs> awesome. And thank you for indulging us in that one. Um, well, I know where I'm going to dinner tonight now. Right. Like right. That's part of it. We got to get people hungry. <laughs> got me thinking about Mexican. Yeah. <laughs>
I think this might be a good place for us to give some final thoughts on this uh, podcast for people. And I would love to hear from both of you on just, uh, yeah, final thoughts on running live events and even maybe high ticket offers or even just what we just talked about community, but uh, some final thoughts to finish off this episode for people. I'll let either one of you go first. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, I'll let Jeff end it. I'll go real fast and let Jeff close it out. I, um, you know, I was thinking when you were talking, Jeff, I was literally, or um, Chris was just about to say that, you know, it is hard to sell community, right? People don't buy community, they stay for it. And the the only place that's not true is in a live event format. And that content connection community piece that starts on day one of a three day and is woven through, you know, I think people don't sit here and think I need to buy this community. But what they think is, I love these people. I feel connected to these people. These are my people. And, you know, this has been a theme at PLF Live forever, right? Like the RimWorld concept. And I think it matters a lot. You know, I said it earlier, but you can have the most amazing spouse, the most amazing friends, the most amazing family, and they can still not be your like-minded community. And it'll only get you so far. And, you know, so often those very same people are trying so hard to keep you safe. You know, that's their job. Like most of us consider our job is to keep safe, keep you safe. But a lot of times what will keep you safe will keep you stuck. And so, you know, what's really powerful about putting people around other like-minded people is having this feeling like, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. People do this. Like, this is a thing. Like, this really is a thing. And you think it's like borderline insanity when you are the only person in your family who thinks, I'm an entrepreneur. I could do this. Or I'm going to go on a ledge. I'm going to teach people piano. I'm going to create a business out of my bedroom. You know, that's considerably insane. Like entrepreneurship is considerably insane. You have to be a little bit Looney Tunes to be willing to go there. And to try and do it alone is just like, it's just the hardest thing, right? Even when you have the best people around you. And if you don't have good people around you, I mean, forget about it. Like that's 10 times harder. So to the fact that we get to guide people to finding a like-minded community so that they don't feel alone. So they get to be championed by people who have already figured it out, who've gone before them. And then to help people who are coming behind them. Like, I don't know that there's any more powerful work you could do. And, um, you know, enrollment, we've talked about this a lot today is just a path to that. You know, high ticket offers are a path to that. Live events are a path to that. Enrollment is a path to that. So if you're out there and your your launch family, and you were thinking, is this my time? Am I ready? Can I do this? Will this work? I would just invite you to step into enrolling yourself into the belief that not only is it possible, it's real. Like it's real. It's a thing. There's nothing like launch and the combination of launch and live event, that one-two punch of the leverage of launch and live event is probably one of the most like you know, legacy makers you could possibly have, you know, to go from nothing. And I think we're all kind of in that boat. Like, you know, we started with not a lot and we have a lot to be grateful for. And none of it would be possible without launch, without live events, without high ticket offers, without enrollment. So now's your time. You can do this. If you're out there waiting in the wings, do it. And if you've done it and you it didn't work as well as you thought, do it again. Repetition, immersion, model proven practices until you get there. Um, Cause it's what it takes. And then just the last thought, I thought of this earlier, but I think it's really important is I think it's supposed to be hard. Like I think so often we want an easy button and I, I really have come to believe that it's not meant to be easy. Like I think the entrepreneurial journey is hard for a reason because resistance builds muscle and you need muscle to do this. And muscle is how we build character and how we build resilience and how we build strength and how we build positivity and how we, how we, create all the things for ourselves that matter. Like we're the sum of all our parts. So all the things that you've done have led you to this point of being ready to be on this journey. And it's okay that it's hard. Like it's good that it's hard because it's worth it. Like it's worth it. So do it, get out there and do it. Just do it. So I think that I invented the launch product launch formula because I was uncomfortable asking for the sale. At the end of the day, I didn't know how to sell. I didn't know how to make offers. And so I created this, this mechanism that was so powerful that you almost didn't even have to make an offer. Much better if you made the offer, but you almost didn't have to make the offer. And I think I did that because I was just uncomfortable with selling, uncom uncomfortable with sales. Um, and then um, I, I actually, Lisa Sasevich, a, a mutual friend of ours, is someone that started to shift me a little bit. And I got a little more comfortable with it. But then in 2010, 
I'm pretty sure it was 2010, I met Barry and I met her husband, Blue. And one of the biggest business mistakes I ever made was that I didn't actually start working with them until 2015. So we met in Strategic Coach. We would talk. We got to know each other, but I didn't get around to hiring them until that 2015. And my and and working with Blue and Barry, and specifically we're huddling backstage with Barry. She taught me how to really step into making offers in an authentic way, in a powerful way, in a way that served my audience. And I am, it's made a huge difference. A high ticket offer, if you're in the business and you're selling programs, you're selling a membership site, you're selling courses, and you don't have a high ticket offer, well, you can basically double the size. Most businesses can double the size of their business with a high ticket offer and do so without spending more money on advertising in general, because you're selling to the people who are already sold to. So high ticket offer, whatever that is, whether it's 5,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 or a hundred thousand is I think becoming critical for any type of digital business these days. And um, Barry and Blue not only helped me design our high ticket, but they helped me make the offer and feel good about making the offer and, and step into making that offer and understanding that sales truly is service. I think that's been the, the theme throughout this entire conversation. That's something that, that's a phrase that I learned from Barry is that sales done right, sales is service. And so um, anytime I get the chance to talk to Barry, uh, we've mentioned a few, I mean, we get together at least three or four times a year and we spend hours and hours and hours talking because we just have this mind melt thing going on. But um, Barry, thank you for everything you've done for me in my life, in my business. Oh my gosh. Well, no thanks for necessary. You changed our life forever. Like I talk about that a lot, not just to you, but to anyone who will listen. Um, the space that you created for us and held for us because you could see more for us than we could see for ourselves and how you welcomed us into your world first um, by having us plan your live events and then by being part of the Plat Plus family literally changed our life forever in so many ways that you couldn't possibly calculate. And I'm forever, forever grateful, forever grateful. And so enjoy every minute I get to spend with you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Barry, for coming on to our show today. And we appreciate it. Um, so many great, great nuggets of wisdom coming out of today. And I know we're going to have lots of ripples from this conversation that we just had. And so for all of you out there listening, thank you for tuning in, Launch Family. And we hope this conversation encourages you, inspires you to dare to launch. On the next episode of Dare to Launch. I guess this is part of that community building that I don't know how I do it <laughs> as, as I'm thinking about this now. But it, it it's so important to get them to be fully all in for the event and as much as possible, leave the outside world behind and say, I'm in this place of unlimited possibility, of unlimited empowerment, of, uh, of unlimited capability. And we have, there's limits to everything, but we're in a room where we can create together far more than any of us can create on our own. And so the more I can get them to be fully present to what's happening on the stage, but also to each other and what's happening between each other, then the more powerful that event will be. And so that first session is, that's what it's all about.